The Unconventional Therapist Guide to Nothing. Hey everyone, we are The Unconventional Therapist, and this is your guide to nothing, a podcast where we take a topic, theme, or thing, analyze it, and make it all make sense in the scheme of life, living, and mental health. I am Dave. I am here with my co-host, Greg, a.k.a. Big Papa. Oh, okay. I, you always get me every time because that, I didn't, <laughs> how could you see that coming? Big Papa. Yeah, I get that sometimes, I guess. Dave, this, this episode got me in that pre-Valentine's Day mood. Yeah. Right? And I think that when you picked it, this is what you had in mind, right? It's exactly what I had in mind. We're on the cusp of Valentine's Day next month. Uh, and it's like, how do we get ourselves in that very sexy mood? I mean, you are a romantic, I can tell. Oh, totally. So, so let me overview this thing, and uh, we can dive right in, right? In 1974, across multiple states, a handsome, charismatic man would murder at least 18 men, women, and children by shooting, stabbing, or strangling. The victims, in some cases, were sexually assaulted before death, in some cases after death. Today, we're talking about, on this special Valentine's Day, special, (laughs) a lot of specials there, Paul John Knowles, a.k.a. the Casanova Killer. And, you know, I get, like, twisted up on his name every single time I say it. Paul never belongs before a John. It should be John Paul Knowles. Um, Actually, if we're doing, like, ranking Beatles, I think this is going to be a hot take, but I go Paul first. So Paul, John, I'm a Paul John. You're a John Paul. You're just thinking of the popes. You know how you're I like was, all, you're I into, was thinking popes. You're into popes. This is, this is not a pope story, though. I got to tell you, this is no, it's definitely not, not a pope story. All right, let's hit it. Early life, born in Orlando, raised in Jacksonville. Already, I mean, Florida man, right? Isn't yeah, that's the first thing I thought of when I when I started digging into this. I was like, Florida, go figure. That makes I, complete sense. I don't know how much you were able to find here about super early life. A lot. Oh, you did? Okay. Because it's, it's, I just know that the father was very physically ab- abusive and he got in trouble a lot as a kid. Yeah. Interesting little little take I got on this. Okay. From word on the street. They, they, so they grew up in seven people living in a three-room home. Not a three-bedroom home. Three total rooms. Seven people. Mm-hmm. So poverty, as you mentioned, abuse, Paul John, a.k.a. PJ, actually <laughs> describes the living environment as just there being a lack of caring in his family. So we are very early on see somebody who doesn't feel nurtured or cared for or cared about. And I think that that's something we'll probably get back to. Yeah, we probably will. And as a response to this, he starts a, at a very young age, a life of crime, maybe starting at seven, stealing yeah. bikes. And, you know, if you're not getting a lot of attention at home, you find ways to, to get attention. And if someone confronted him about these little crimes, he would act out in, in rage. And maybe that's all that's how, what he knew. That's what he was. That's what he yeah. viewed as, that's a, that's a response to things, right? When you when you witness that from you know a parent, so his brother was interviewed in one of the sources that I that I watched, and he reported like like you said the physical abuse being very bad, and the living environment environment being so bad that if they were around today, that everybody would have been removed from that home. Mm-hmm. All the kids would have been removed. Really poor conditions. So he is even in the seventies though he is removed. How does that work? He he is removed from the home and he bounces around from right. foster, foster home to foster home, right? Yes. And, and then, uh, yeah, so he's he's foster homed. And then after uh, some sort of petty crime, he ends up going to a place called the Dozier School for Boys, also known, known as the Florida State School for Boys. Did your parents used to drive, like if you drive by the bad boy school and tell you if you kept it up, they were going to send you over there. Never in my life, Greg. Okay. So Never. That's my parenting, my parents' parenting style. And I, and I, I appreciate it. So yes, he did. He did end up going to the, the Florida school for boys, but not just once he would, before the age of 17, he would be there six times. 
Mm. And did you dig into this school a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty terrible school. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Sleepers? Yes. Well, the Wilkinson Homeschool for Boys. This was, this reminded me of that, like reading about this school. Uh, it was like hell on earth. You know, he, yeah. he visited hell six times after a hellish childhood. And what was going on in this school? Like, what did you pick up from this? Oh, well, the conditions were horrible. And one of the stats was like out of 300 boys that were sent there, 81 of them died on the grounds mm-hmm. and buried on the were, grounds. They were actively dying. And, and uh, th- so there's physical abuse that that was, you know, at the hands of the people that work there that was leading them to death. That's insane. And there was even a basement chamber that they had a little nickname for and they called it the rape room. Mm. And I mean, you can imagine what happens in there. <laughs> I think that's less of a nickname, more just a yeah. pretty it's a descriptor, terrible descriptor. What goes on? Oh, boy. And, and, you know, it's it's crazy because this school, uh, the reasons why kids would be here, you know, if someone's for like serious crimes and things like that. But some would be for like these little petty things, such as like smoking at school mm. and you would get sent here. So there's kids here who really need discipline. And then there's other kids who just did what kids do and got caught. Places like this are part of a whole troubled teen, troubled children industry that was big back in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. And it created a lot of monster. Now, I'm not saying this school was the catalyst that created PJK, the Casanova Killer, the monster. But, I mean, it didn't help. So, yeah, in my opinion, like this, like he has those early, early stages of, you know, trauma and abuse that he's experienced and the lack of like caregiving. And then he bounces around home to home and then ends up at a place like this. It's like he never actually ever has like a permanent home or place where he's ever cared for or treated like he's a, you know, a worthwhile human. Right. Right. So this this takes us up to about his late teens. It doesn't end there. I mean, at 19, that's where he logs his first arrest. Mm-hmm. Police officer stops him for a traffic violation. And what does he do? He kidnaps the police officer. Of course. Why not? <laughs> and from that point on, he ends up spending uh, one of the stats I read. I don't know how accurate this is, but I mean, it's even just to have like remotely near this would be crazy to imagine that he spent about six months of every year from 19 on for in prison for burglary, auto theft and other minor crimes up until about the, the year of 1974. Right. Well, do you want to mention when he's in prison and this is sort of, this is how things start as, as I read it or, and as I heard, but he's, he's in prison and he starts, and he reaches out and he gets in touch with a divorcee from San Francisco, I think. And they yeah. somehow, from jail, he, he convinces this woman to marry him. And she paid all his legal fees. But when he's released, she decides that there's a couple of red flags and she's going to call this thing off. A couple of red flags. Also, she's informed by a psychic that this might not be the man for her. I mean, and you don't have to be Miss Cleo to figure this one out. That psychic, was, that was the easiest task for any psychic. Like, don't do this. No. But he has a really strong reaction to this ending so, of the engagement. A- Angela Kovic uh, is her name. Thanks, Angela. And, she started yeah. Playing. Well, the, you know, the psychic sa- uh, tells her that she for- foresees a new dangerous man entering her life and that freaks her out. Yeah. So, you know, I think that but do you the think the psychic was saying that because she was talking about her boyfriend that she was going to marry from prison? Well, the psychic, if she's doing her job, shouldn't know that. Okay. They're not supposed to know background information on the people that they're doing readings for. Mm. So, you know, could she be, could she have known this and, you know, kind of been scamming her? Could this be somebody who really is, um, you know, able to predict these kind of things? I don't know. Mm. But you're right. This whole, so there was this whole endeavor of them corresponding and her visiting him. So she was a divorced woman from California, I uh, think from San Francisco, and she's visiting him and, you know, they're corresponding. She gets the money, as you mentioned, for the lawyers to help his release. And then he's granted parole in May of 1974. So 
he immediately leaves prison, travels to San Francisco to marry her, and she's now changed her mind. Greg, <sighs> that night, do you know how he responded? He does what any one of those just distraught, brokenhearted fellows would do. They go out into the streets of San Francisco and murder three people. Yeah. Three people are murdered. But this isn't verified. So I think this is his his based on his confession, which will explain later how that has like that information all came about. Right. Uh, so, you know, I guess we can like kind of start off there. Some of these murders are verified and some of them are, you know, claims. That's why I said 18 method. off the top, because it's it's. Yeah. It's 18 to 30, possibly 35 murders. Yeah. Um, and after this, after he allegedly murders three people in the streets, he, he takes off back to Jacksonville and is arrested again for stabbing a bartender. But he picked the lock of his cell, which I think is awesome. You don't hear about like people yeah. picking locks too much anymore. And this started his four-month multi-state murder spree. Yes. Yeah, so he picks the lock on July 26th of 1974. Um, so, I mean, just kind of think about like, when we describe this, you got to think about the time period. We start in May when he's paroled. Mm-hmm. Two months later, he's in a fight and he's escaping prison. The night that he escapes prison, he invades the home of a 65-year-old woman named Alice Curtis. When he's there, he leaves her bound and gagged as he ransacks her, her home and money for money. And uh, he ends up taking her car. She ends up choking to death on her gag, mm-hmm. which is uh just like the thinking about that just made me cringe so bad like imagine just having this thing at this thing in your mouth and you cannot get it out to the, the point stockings. where stockings it's like they're uh, one tied around her neck and one shoved down her throat what a horrible way to go horrible horrible way uh so but this is kind of his mo so he there is a lot of home invasion involved with with pj like he breaks into people's homes he's and he loots and he takes cars. That's like definitely an, like part of his MO as well, which, you know, we see a couple of times. Well, you say MO, but the modus operandi for, uh, for us laymen, um, he, the thing is though, and as you list these crimes, Dave, because you, your due diligence of going through them all, um, what I notice about them is they're, and what makes him so dangerous and so difficult for the police to understand that they're dealing with a serial killer is there really isn't a specific type or he doesn't kill them all in the same way. He doesn't yeah. kill all the same types of people. Like with other serial killers, you might have every, all blondes with short hair. What look out. Cause that's, that's somebody's thing. But for this one, it's like anybody is fair game. Anything's possible out there. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. There are a few murders that seem similar and they make sense. Like if he were to have an MO, uh, an MO, he, this like would be like it, the home invasion piece. But then there's a bunch of ones that go along the way that don't fit this at all. So they call him a spree killer at the time, right? Mm. I, I believe that was what they titled him. The term serial killer had not been coined yeah. yet. I thought that was when they, he left a few of those spree candies on everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I immediately thought of the spree candies. <laughs> How appropriate for Valentine's Day, right? That's right. Like yeah. those, those spree candies is the little hearts. Spree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so he ends up, so he's taking her car around. Um, he sticks around town for a little while. So the guy's got no remorse, you know, no conscious. He murders someone and he's able to hang around the town and he's not too worried. Suddenly his pictures start showing up on the TV and he realizes, you know, it's time to go. So he's going to ditch the car when he spots 11-year-old Lillian Anderson and seven-year-old, her seven-year-old sister, Milet, um, who he recognizes as they must be daughters of his mother's friend or something along the line. Like, so they're, they're people who know him, basically. And when he sees them, he fears that they're going to inform someone that they saw him. So he kidnaps an 11-year-old and a seven-year-old and strangles, their, strangles them and then dumps their body in a swamp outside town. Yeah, so 65 to children. Yep. And and it goes on and on, Dave. Yeah. Keep it going. And so now we got the next day. The next day. This is the speed of these murders mm-hmm. is crazy. So the next day, Atlantic Beach, Florida, breaks into the home of Marjorie Howe and then strangles her with nylon stockings and then steals her TV. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Maybe he needs money. I don't know. Maybe he's selling it. Uh, his next victim was a teenage hitch- hitchhiker who he raped and strangled. Um, not really for any reason at all, as he was traveling north because the man's traveling all over the place at this point. Um, on August 23, so uh, 23rd, so we're flash forward a little bit. He invades the home of Kathy Pierce, strangling her with a ter- telephone cord while her three-year-old son watched. Yeah. Interesting enough here, though, he leaves the boy unharmed. And C- maybe he was does that make at- you wonder? Well, it makes me feel like maybe he's look he identified with the boy. Maybe he sees little PJK in the boy. Yeah. It I- makes me wonder if that was a little girl, if he would have given the same, you know, response. Um, I, I mean, I think he wouldn't have. I think he would have probably murdered the, the three-year-old girl because I think he so already too. murdered two kids and, you know, he does it again later, so. Right, and is the hate that's going through him right now is fueled a lot by Angela in that rejection, so he's, right. he's that's Yeah, he's and I mean, I, yeah, I want to just kind of, like, point that out. Like, we're just kind of going through these murders right now. We'll get to, like, our thoughts about the Why? process and yeah. the thought, like, right. the thoughts behind these. So it seems pretty aimless and unprovoked as i'm reading these so i think that's a good point greg uh september 3rd so this is like what a little over a week later he meets a businessman named william bates at a tavern in lima ohio um he has a few drinks with him before strangling and dumping his body in nearby woods uh which wouldn't be discovered till october he steals money credit cards Mm -hmm. and the guy's car and he takes his car and makes his way to sacramento so I mean, this guy's traveling. traveling. Yeah, he gets to, he puts distance between him and his victims for sure. Yeah, for sure. So he goes to Sacramento, then he goes back through Utah, and while he's going through Utah, he stops at Eli, Nevada, murders two campers, Emmett and Lewis Johnson, on September 18th. So two weeks later, for what reason? I don't for know. No reason at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's like his, then it's, it's almost like he's a hurricane and he has no, re- it, there's, it's almost like a natural force that has no regard for, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And it makes yeah. it terrifying. Yeah. You know what I'm thinking? Like, right. As we're describing this and you say that it almost reminds me of like a horror movie, mm-hmm. honestly, like a slasher horror movie where there's, and even those are not like this. Like it would be more like a Jason Voorhees where he's walking through the woods, just killing the campers, but he's killing them because they're campers. Well, he's no country for old men. Oh yeah. Kind it's of like, for, like whatever, anyway. any in yeah. the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. No you purpose, know, no meaning to it. That's a good reference because I, I, when I think of someone like, you know, Michael Myers, for example, in the Halloween movies, he always goes for people who are, like towards his path to his, mm-hmm. to who he's trying to get to, he rarely ever just goes for random people. This guy is literally anyone. The you're randomness in the way. is the scariness. Yeah, it's what's yeah. scary about it. You're not right. even in the way, actually. You're just there, and he's like, ooh, that's opportunity. So, yeah. So, three days after the September 18th murders, he passes through Sequin, Texas. He spots a female motorist stranded on the roadside, He stops to help her, but actually then just rapes her and strangles her to death, drags her body through a tangled barbed wire fence. (sighs) Now, was he able, and we'll talk about this, but I know that he would attempt to rape a lot of these people and So obviously we're not, we're not able to get, um, you know, the story with, with that one, but you know, in the future ones with people who had escaped or survived. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that absolutely is true. Um, so s- September 23rd, he meets a woman named Ann Dawson in Birmingham who, who he catches the attention of. She, you know, falls for him and he ends up traveling with her and for about six days. till so September 29th until he kills her. Um, so interesting there. So he finds someone that's kind of a companion for a very short period of time. But this time, what does he do before they can reject him? Well, there's that murders of them. But the other thing is, I think she was she bankrolling him. Maybe was awesome. she a source of income? I mean, he's awesome. using people. He uses people. He's like a parasite. Yeah. He uses them, and and then when they're useless, he discards them. Sure. So her body was never found, actually. So that's another one of those ones that he reports uh, murdering, but they weren't able to verify that. So he travels. More so, he goes through Oklahoma, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, 
And he actually goes through a little bit of period of time where it seems like maybe he didn't hurt anyone else for from now until about October. And then brings us to October 19th, Woodford, Virginia. He invades the home of Doris Hovey, I think her name is. Mm-hmm. Hovey. Hey, I, I, what is it? Hovey. Hovey. Okay. Yeah, that sounds probably more accurate. Uh, he just... shoots, her, shoots her dead with her husband's rifle. And this is odd. Then he wipes his prints from the gun and places it beside her body to elude the police. And, you know, this is like kind of out of character behavior for him to do something of that nature, as opposed to just dump the body or even just leave the body and just flee. Yeah, so, so what do you think that's about? I, it's it's weird. It's almost like it's almost like he changes. Or is he like getting better at it? You know, is he becoming yeah. like starting to if he wants if he's enjoying this, if he wants to keep this going and we'll talk about his motivation soon. But that's going to play into what, what I think is going on here. So I actually was kind of thinking that I think this kind of marks the turning point for him where I, I don't know what exactly causes this, but I do think he's starting to now realize that like at some point this is coming to an end. Mm-hmm. Like at some point I am going to get busted. So he does this. And he, you know, races the the fingerprints with hopes that, you know, it wouldn't get tracked to him. He's still in the guy's car. William, what was it? William Bates that I had mentioned before. Um, he still has that car. So he didn't change his car. Not a bright idea. So he's he picks up two hitchhikers in Key West. So now he went from Virginia. Now he's back in Key West <laughs> with intention to kill them. But he ends up getting pulled over for a traffic violation. And ironically, the cop ends up letting him go with just a warning. So <laughs> nothing happens but he gets freaked out. He ends up dropping off the, the hitchhikers in Miami. And then he calls his, his lawyer, Sheldon Yavitz yeah. and does it for advice. And I believe this is where he ends up doing the huge confession where he's like, I'm a mass killer. Yeah. He tells the lawyer killer. that and he, yeah. and he records the, the tapes uh, like yeah, chronicling all his crimes. Yeah. And he ends up bringing that to the lawyer. Yeah. I think what scared him about getting pulled over was that, the police saw him with the two women and he thinks that they sure. he, would, he would be able to identify it. Yeah. So it seems like th- this is the spiral almost like this is him kind of losing control, feeling like uh, I, I might be getting to my end here. This, this idea of him calling his lawyer reminded me of, I don't know if you've seen the movie American psycho with um, yeah, with yeah, yeah. Christian Bale, the scene where he calls, he calls his lawyer at the end and he starts to just, he leaves a voicemail detailing all these murders that he did. Uh, that's what this scene reminds me of right here. What a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, the funny thing is I, I heard something about this lawyer, Sheldon Yavitz, and I don't know how accurate it is because I'm just hearing one report, but this is a guy who represents criminals. The criminals. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. his thing. Knowing he, and he knows their guilt too. That's mm. what someone made it made important to recognize that he knows that they're guilty and he likes the challenge of getting someone who he knows is guilty off of the crime. Yeah, and that's a that's a dirty guy. Yeah. So, I mean, he hears this. I mean, it, it's shocking for him. But at the same time, you know, he's he's still going to do what he can to protect him. Yeah, it's a big challenge. So still nothing really happens here for for uh, for Paul, Paul, John, uh, November 6th. We're out, we're out already. So this started back in May. Now we're at November. We're in Macon, Georgia, and he befriends Carswell Carr and is invited to spend the night at Carswell's house um, over drinks. He <laughs> stabs Carr to death and mm-hmm. then strangles his 15 year old daughter failing in an attempt to have sex with her corpse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That I think we're going to see that a lot. Not so Casanova of him with that. Not, not very Casanova. But what's up with the guy being named car car. Carswell cars car. <laughs> it's an interesting name. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> And he killed, is, is this the, stabbed him with scissors, right? I believe so. Yeah, believe. that's too gruesome. Yeah. And you know what he's doing is he's disarming. He's, so he'll have drinks with people. He charms them. He's then, handsome as hell. I mean, we've looked, what people have said Koresh is handsome. And, and we've talked about people saying that Manson was handsome. And, and, other, and we've kind of said, I don't know. I don't really see it. When you look at this guy, yeah. He's handsome. Yeah, some pictures. And then some pictures, he looks a little rough. Uh, but yeah, but it, I mean, the general consensus is definitely like from some of the survivors. Yeah. The reports are like, you know, I would have gone on a date with him 
had you know this not like outside of all this like i he would have been someone i was attracted to so yeah yeah there's something about you know looks he has the looks but he also has this it feels like there's maybe this charisma to him and i actually yeah. don't know if it's charisma or just arrogance that comes off as like confidence or, or maybe there's just something off about him and people find that intriguing sure you know there's just something mysterious and yeah there's something there though. He so the Casanova is kind of an interesting nickname, and we can get back to that because it, mm-hmm. it fits, but then it doesn't fit. But then it does, and I'll tell you why. Okay. <laughs> uh so we end up finding out. All right, so he November 6th, he he murders Carswell Carr and his daughter. We end up during this time, we end up finding out that he also on November 2nd was linked to a murder of a hitchhiker, uh Edward Hillard, who was found in nearby woods, and his companion Debbie Griffin who is still missing. So, you know, there are a couple of murders that we weren't aware of that ended up coming to light. Debbie, November, not Debbie Gibson, who not Debbie Gibson also seems to be missing for since the eighties. No man. She's around. Oh, is she? Okay. Yeah. He's been on another part of your catalog. He's been on some stuff. All right. All right. Uh, uh, November 8th while bar hopping. Uh, so this is the interesting story that I, I think, gave this whole story some publicity more so than just the for the murder piece so on november 8th he's bar hopping in atlanta he meets a british journalist named sandy fox Mm. yeah yeah sandy fox yep and she states that he she was impressed with his gaunt good looks actually i thought that was a super accurate yeah yeah description because his face is like long and drawn it's like that tuberculosis i'm passing away look that used to be so in vogue. Oh, it's so in vogue. <laughs> so she is drawn to him. What I heard is that he may have caught her looking at him. And that kind of gave him the like, oh, all right, I, I'll go ahead and I'll approach her. Um, he actually asked her to dance. And, you know, that's a pretty, pretty bold move. And this isn't like a dance club. No. So he's at a bar or wherever they're at. And he asked her to dance. And then they end up spending the night together. However. As we Sandy. kind of alluded to, he is unable to perform in bed. Right. And he ends up continuing to fail repeatedly at sex over the next two days. He's like, this never happens. I swear to God, Sandy. Yeah. But Sandy, it does happen. This is a first. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try again. Like, and like you know, we don't, we're not the type of people to rub it in, but I'm glad this happened to him. Are I you? Am. Yeah, I am. Well, you shouldn't be glad because then he takes his rage out on Sandy's friend two days later, oh. uh, picking up Susan McKenzie and demanding sex at gunpoint. But the good thing is she ends up escaping and notifies the police. But this dude, oh my God, this guy. So Super. when they when they pull him over, he pulls off a, a sawed off shotgun and makes an escape. And the boldness, that's how you it's ass- crazy. If this was today, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, we're on November. He would have, and he was released in what we said, May. Yeah. He would have been caught in May in, in, in prison in May. Like this, it's just like a series of follies that yeah. got him. I mean, you remember how it started. He, he picked a lock and took off. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like that story of, was it Bundy who jumped out the court window, in, the courtroom window in Utah? Different time. It's like, who leaves a courtroom window open? You know, it's like, how do you pick a lock? Well, that's what I'd love to know. I've always been curious about that. Picking locks? Yeah, that's always been a sort of an interest of mine. He's like a handsome Houdini. I'll get you a lock picking kit. I don't think locks lend themselves to picking as much as they used to back then. I think it was a lot. Depends on the type of lock. A bent paper clip. Yeah, you're right. We we actually tightened up our lock policy because of PGK. So... (laughs) Locks are different these days. One There's good thing that came on. from it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he is. He makes his escape. He now is in West Palm Beach. He invades yet another home, Beverly Maybe, and abducts her sister, stealing her car, then dropping off the hostage in Fort Pierce, Florida. So for some reason, doesn't kill the sister. If I remember correctly, Beverly Maybe that I just mentioned, I be- do believe that he tried to rape her. He did, and, and, and she but he couldn't she- perform. She's the Beverly, maybe, maybe I the hate worst her sister quote. of all time. Do you know what she did? Her, she, he was going to rape and murder her, and he needed her, her to take him somewhere. And he, she said, "I don't have a car. 
Oh yeah. My, my sister will be here soon and she'll yeah. take you. Now this yeah. is at gunpoint. It's like, how much yeah. do you hate your sister to, to have that happen? So he takes his sister and they both somehow survive. There is a short documentary about PGK and Beverly maybe is interviewed and she makes a comment in that, that I just, it just irked the hell out of me. It was something about like, he tried to rape me, but he couldn't because he wasn't normal. He was not a man. Yeah. And it's like, all right, this is a horrible person. Oh, but Dave, like, you're like, feeling that? Dude, you're no, so nice. Paul John is a horrible person, but yeah. still, like, think about the statement you're making, because that doesn't just happen to Paul John Knowles. It happens to oh, other yes, men in general. And to say that a statement like that, and it's like, lady, who are you? And then someone's uh, watching that being like, oh, God, I knew it. No, it wasn't normal. <laughs> uh, so anyways, yeah, that's, that's a reoccurring theme as we're getting at. All right, we're almost done, I promise, guys. <laughs> this is just like, I, I hope that the length that this whole section is taking just yeah. highlights the craziness to this story and the amount of terror this guy was able to cause in such a short duration of time. So this is the span of months not years not years no so inside of a year yeah inside of a year this and this keeps going so he as he drops off the hostage like i said her sister and he's driving police officer recognizes the stolen car and the next morning uh the next morning after this and he pulls Knowles over but again yet another police officer just not prepared or ready to do the to do the thing that's going to stop him Knowles is quick to react and ends up taking the officer hostage and drives away in the patrol car. He then uses the patrol car's siren to pull over another driver named James Mayer, and then they switch into that car. So now he has two hostages. He has like the police officer and James Mayer, just a mm -hmm. you know civilian, and he's in this car. He takes them to Pulaski County, Georgia. So they make it from Fort Pierce, Florida to Pulaski County, Georgia. I don't know how long of a ride that is, but it sounds like it's probably a lot. Mm. And he handcuffs them both to a tree and shoots them at close range in the back of the head. Yeah. This is, this is like it's something. Intense. A yeah. cop. I mean, not that a cop is, you know, a different form of human, but like that's it's brazen bold mm. that's bold because that's you know yeah it's it's just another level because of the boldness around it and the statement that makes handcuffing so, a cop and a civilian and then shooting them both in the back of the head to a tree which uh somebody ends up you know finding finding these two people someone's in the woods and ends up stumbling on them james mayer mm. so he after this you know he's takes off he attempts to drive through a police roadblock, which I don't know if that was because they were doing, you know, checks to, to yeah. find him or if they were just doing construction or something. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I have no idea, but he loses control of his car, smashes into a tree, gets chased on foot. He's being pursued by dogs, helicopters. And then finally he is cornered by, and this is, I mean, this is so perfect. An armed civilian on November 17th. So rather than a cop, because obviously that hasn't gone so well. He handles the cops. The, the armed yeah. civilian is what you need. Yeah. I, I almost feel like he's ready for the cops. Like yeah. he sees a cop, he's like, oh, that's, that's <laughs> awesome. I couldn't I could not wait. Where's my lock picking kit? Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready for the handcuffs. So all right. So is this how he finally gets sent to like we're we're in jail? And maybe we should leave him there while we discuss like yeah. The, I just yeah. Greg, something really interesting that I heard happened, and I I, I hope this is true because I'm gonna repeat it now. <laughs> okay. They he is asked a question about how many people he killed. And he said, at what, at what age did I, was I uh, imprisoned from society or something like that? And I think the person like, you know, talking to him said like 18, and he writes 18 on his hand. And they think that was to symbolize that the, like the 18 people he murdered. Yeah. But then he said it was 35. But then he said 35, so I don't yeah. even understand that. I can't story. trust this guy. You know what? I don't trust him. I don't trust him. <laughs> that story was probably fake. It just sounded like, <laughs> sounded good. Let's talk about, so I, I'm just going to like whip through diagnosis because I don't think that's as important as what we think actually was motivating these crimes. Because I think that there's a lot of ways to go for that. So diagnosis is pretty simple. 
antisocial personality disorder, you see the the lack of empathy of yeah bl- bl- blatant lack of empathy. He had no regrets, felt absolutely nothing for killing men, women, women, and children in various different methods. You know, obviously stealing bikes in seven years old, no regard for social norms, no regard for rules. It's different than not understanding social norms. It's and what about the what about the attitude against authority? Horrible attitude against authority. Um, I mean, he's literally shooting cops. But I don't like think that, that that's symbolic to me. It's the attitude, but more than anything, it's the callous nature of his murders. How no one is safe. There's no there's no one safe around him. There's, I, I he, for him, it's everyone else's fault. It's never his fault. But my fiance broke up with me, so I'm going to go murder three people. When I looked at what the doctors were diagnosing him with, they were saying like major depressive disorder. And I don't know about that. I mean, to me, that this has like, where do they even, where are they even finding that? Um, I mean, could he have been depressed? Sure. <laughs> sure. But I don't think that's what's leading. I mean, this. Oh, this you is know, a- you know what makes me think that. So he makes a statement during an interview when he's imprisoned and they ask like, what would you do over if you could do with, anything over in your life and he goes i wouldn't i would never want to live this life again i know and if he said that to me i'd be like shut up baby because he's yeah because he this is that's so easy to say now that you're caught and in prison and it's over it's 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 hard to decide what motivates him because some serial killers kill their mother over and over again they kill that that image or they kill their father over and over again, like you, that might have, you would have thought that that would have been possible for him or an ex or a group of people that bullied him. They kill them over and over again, but he killed everyone. So it's hard to start to think about what drove him. Yeah. You know, so, so was antisocial personality disorder, is that the only um, diagnosis that you thought for him? Um, so I didn't dig in, I didn't really conceptualize him too much as far as diagnosis because i i was more interested in what created him sure. environmentally why what i had it i well greg let me take out my dsm uh <laughs> so i also was thinking about you know that early early upbringing and mm-hmm. those disruptions in the home life so i was thinking possibly you know a reactive attachment leading to a borderline personality disorder as he gets older uh there's Definitely, you know, the poor relationships with family, the lack of feeling as if anybody cares about him, uh, the disruptions and the bouncing around from foster care, you know, starts with his family, goes into foster care homes, and then going into the the boys' school. So never really having this sense of a family. Well, you're Uh, making me think of something. Well, then flash forward, and he does put trust into somebody. He does... Mm -hmm think that he has a bond with someone and then they end up leaving him, which we kind of, we identify like that's the night he commits three murders, supposedly, you know, that seems important. That seems impactful that moment. And it's almost like that strengthened this core belief that at some point everybody leaves relationships are temporary and unimportant. So why should I put any value into them? And also I'm going to control the relationships. You know, sadly, his way of controlling is murder. It's right. ter- terrorizing people. But it's also this weird, like, flex, you know? It's this flex of control. Like that woman, he picks up for six days. And then he's like, I'm done with you. Stab, stab, stab. So it's like, I don't value you you in my life. I don't value this relationship. And I have all the control in the world. I'm going to get rid of you before you ever could get rid of me. Well, it was made sense. It- that behavior served a purpose when he was young for to not grow attached to anyone because his parents yeah. essentially abandoned him. And I think there's a quote by William James, who is the father of psychology. Oh, Willie <laughs> James. Yeah. Willie James. He says that the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Yeah. And this, this is something PGK, PJK never got. And another thing is he, when he was young, he identified with villains. He loved the bad guys. And, you know, is, is it fame? It, what was it? Like, it's it's not some, for some serial killers, like, like Dahmer, for instance, it's not some unnatural sexual impulse. 
it, it, that was driving him. It's it's something. Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's notoriety. Oh, I was actually also toggling with the idea mm. of narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. So it's almost like a mix of a lot of different things here with this individual. So he has this like sense of grandiosity, which I think is like it's almost strengthened by the fact that he does have good looks. Mm. So he, you know, he gets this reinforcement and this sense of self that's not real. Like he, his personality isn't real. It's whatever, you know, he thinks is going to get him what he wants. Right. So he's able to attract people. It gives him the sense of confidence. He desires notoriety. So he just does. It's like, he wants to be, and he, he did, his confession tape with the hope of getting a book and a movie. So like he, he wanted to be something bigger than life. Well, it's, it's, you know, when you're growing up and you're never, ever seen by your family, you're, you're never, what, what, how, what does that translate to as an adult? It's like, you want to be seen and, and how, what's the most important way to be seen is fame. And it's interesting yeah. because if you have no regard whatsoever for human life and no remorse at all, there's a very easy way to become famous and that's murdering a bunch of people. Sure. And Greg, you know, the thing that we always, you know, identify with parents about reinforcement with kids is kids. If they don't get the positive reinforcement, they'll get it just however they can, which is when they start to like really focus on doing negative behavior because that at least gets them attention. So for him, if he grew up in an environment that he's self-reporting was not a caring one, like nobody cared about him, mm -hmm. they didn't pay him attention, he probably felt positive reinforcement from doing negative things because then suddenly people are looking at him. He liked the attention from not just the media, not just women. He liked the attention from police. I think he liked being chased. I think, he, you know, it's there. But I have a question for you, Greg. This sure. brought up an interesting idea because... The other thing we're balancing here is maybe there's alcoholism. And the reason why I say that is that Sandy Fox, the British journalist in her book that she wrote, she wrote two books about her encounters with him, which, you know, that's kind of weird, but she reports that he would, he drank excessively basically. Mm -hmm. And that was a question of if, if that's why he couldn't perform. So, but I'm like, I'm not sure if it was the alcoholism that. It, well, I have, a, I have a couple of thoughts about that too. If he had a, like impotence, you know? Well, okay. So like you're saying, like you were just saying before, I, and I'll just go through a couple more of these motivators. It's, it's like you're saying about um, sort of, he was thrown into a nightmare childhood and humanity didn't seem to have any regard for him. So why should he have regard for it? And that sort of provides a framework for his callous nature. Like why should he care about humanity and never cared about him? And the other motivator is like we were talking about there with the impotence. So we talked, we talked about the reporter that, that seduced him and he, or he seduced and wasn't able to perform. And even with the postmortem, they said that there was, that some of these victims were raped, but they never found any semen. So it's hard yeah. to, it's hard to say. So, and if you watch any crime shows, you know, semen. Is very However, hard. he, he did perform with some with people. men. With yeah. Men in with prison. men, which is interesting. And, and, and of course, like, if he's able to perform with men in prison, maybe the foundation or the frustration of denying his own sexuality. Um, this is a different time. This is the 70s. The prison mentality thing kind of like always throws me for a loop, though, because it's like if you're feel if you're you know sexually frustrated and you feel like there's no options, there are some people I think that will fall into that. Like, well, I got to do something right and yes. is he doing it because of that or is he doing it because i think he's, he actually think, has an attraction we can't know that but you know D dave this guy doesn't has no regard for authority has no regard for anything he's in prison he's having sex with men he's he doesn't he's not deceiving himself there and he's also not murdering people you know that's yeah. some, there's something there where you had if you have to repress completely repress your identity and you're already ha are are have the propensity to be a psychopath. I mean, that's just, that's just another motivator that's creating this perfect storm, which he becomes. I think one of the things that would have been really telling is if he would have been able to engage sexually with Angela Kovich, who, yeah. you know, the one who, you know, he was really banking on marrying. And I wonder if 
he would have been able <laughs> to be that. sexual with her because like that would have said a lot like if if yes then maybe the fact that she called it off really mentally messed with him she she met so you're saying this too like if she met, if she would have followed through with the marriage no one gets no one it? no one i mean is that is that true i don't know i mean i, I think i, 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 I no think way of knowing it. he still would have been the same person he still would have been engaging in some criminal activity and who knows if how that could have escalated at some point but greg i have a question for you okay if that thought i had about like the narcissistic personality disorder that sense of grandiosity mm -hmm. if that's present how do you think that affects someone who like having the grandiose self-view but fails to perform in ways within how they self-identify like so he views himself as this Casanova killer right mm -hmm. this Rico Suave guy he can pull anybody in he is charismatic as hell anybody would spend the night with him and then he can't even perform okay that's that's to him is gonna say this isn't me this is you you're not good enough to you you're not even good enough to to be near me so your life is worthless and I can kill you you're nothing no because if you're not even enough to arouse me it's never going to be about him. He has to deceive himself of that. And he's, he's emotionless. His father, I mean, let's be honest, beat the emotions out of him when he was a kid. And, you know, su surviving his childhood, part of his brain's defense mechanism is to shut down emotions. And another part is if he becomes the aggressor, he could never be a victim again. Like if he becomes this monster that he thought that he thinks his father was or that he knows his father was, if he becomes that, he can never be hurt by that. Mm. There's a lot of layers to this. There's a ton of layers to this. It's it's actually a much more interesting case than I, I gave it credit for when you initially um, mentioned it. I thought you were just being a little hopeless romantic. Yeah, <laughs> nothing romantic about this, that's for sure. I, I'm so, curious if that could cause rage because there oh, is, of course, there is like that grandiosity, but also there is like a little bit of self-awareness that we see sometimes when he reflects like, oh, I wouldn't do my life over again, things like that. So it's almost like he he views himself this way and he's able to do things, like he's able to attract women, he's able to, but then it's like, oh, then reality hits. Like, oh, I am, I am not able to function that way. Like, oh, I am a failure. I and wonder if, if, and I don't want you to run back all the crimes and maybe I should have paid more attention, but I'm just thinking like, if, if he was unable to perform sexually, did did the, oh, oh, like the knife, the weapon become the object, like the the phallic object that he used that as? Were the stabbings the they victims weren't, who? They weren't all stabbings though. A lot of okay. the women were strangulation. Maybe it just didn't, maybe it just didn't have anything. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's interesting though. I'll, I'll tell you that. I, I but of course you're right. Of course that could be. That's the ultimate frustration. And yeah. whether he's whether he's saying to himself, "Oh, this is you, not me. I'm going to kill you. You're nothing." Somewhere inside of him, he knows. No, this is me. Yeah, I'm not working right. But and, I and work it, right with men. But I'm not working right with women. There's something wrong with me. And I just that point seems important to me because I guess you want to have some sort of understanding of why he would do the things he's doing. I mean. But again, there's so many like of these murders that make zero sense. Mm. Like just finding two campers and murdering them just feels like a thrill crime. Yeah. And thrill crimes are scary. You know, oh. home invasion is scary. And this dude did like four or five home invasions. And, and home invasions are scary, especially when the the person has no problem murdering you. Yeah. And let's oh. talk about how this guy dies. Yeah. Which is another interesting little tidbit you want to you want to run this is one more you know david blaine moment from this guy yeah his final his final <laughs> one the, the so final he, show so he's arrested on the 17th by well an armed civilian stops him and on the 17th he's arrested november 18th they're transforming him transferring him to a maximum security facility uh, i believe he's in a vehicle at the time and he makes a grab for the sheriff's revolver and as he's doing so, FBI agent Ron Angel, hmm. already an angel, Ron. Yep, Ronnie Angel. He shoots him dead in his tracks. Yeah. That is done. And he probably was okay with that. 
but he was getting away again. He yeah. he picked the lock and was getting away again. It, and so running, I, I feel that. like that's if if he could have chosen a way to go out, I feel like mm. that he probably got the way out that he wanted. And they said when they when he passed away, his, his hair still looked fantastic. Yeah, he just strode yeah. about. Yeah. So I, Dave, I think that this seven the seventies, we're like Bundy, Gacy, BTK. The seventies are such a big time for serial killers. There's 605 active serial killers in the 70s versus 117 in the last decade. I mean, what's that about? And there were even more in the 80s, but those 70s serial killers, those are the scary, scary ones. And I think that's, what, what is it? It's a few things. It's, I think there's more outlets for depravity. There's more, like with the internet, I guess, like weird porn, whatever people are doing, there's, well, there's 70s, ways. No, no internet. No, now. So that's oh, why there's, yeah, that's yeah. Why there's less yeah. murder. There's there's more outlets for you to be depressed. Oh, it's, oh, it's more... I understand what you're saying. Yeah, now. it's like you don't have to hide. Like, 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 say it was uh, PJK, and one of the motivators was he didn't want to show people his true sexuality. That's not a thing anymore. It's like whatever. So I mean, even if you're into super weird stuff, there's there's some. I don't, I don't think it's a good thing, but it's out there, right? Hey, you're so, into that? There's a fetish for it. You know, exactly. it's like anything. Which, which I don't really, which I, which is a nut, whole nother podcast because I don't think that's a good thing. But I guess as far as like statistics for serial killers, maybe it is. Um, so, that, you know, less self-deceit means you can be. So basically you don't want people to have fun. Oh, cool, Greg. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> what about more, less hitchhiking? That's definitely a factor. Yeah, hitchhiking has gone down <laughs> because of this time. For yeah, sure. That's that's gonna play a role. More cameras. The locks yeah, aren't. I, as I, I just pick. think that's a big thing, Greg. Is like we know, ma- majority of intelligent people know that you're gonna get caught. Mm-hmm. There are so many different ways you are gonna get caught. You are gonna get caught. I'll say it again. You're gonna get caught. So, yeah, so don't it, do it. It, yeah, don't do it. I think that really does make people not act so i think that fear that we're always being watched is somewhat healthy yeah i don't well i don't think you can pick a lock with a bent paper clip as easy anymore so that's probably not i think they probably uh changed the way handcuffs work they they gave cops real handcuffs instead of toy handcuffs yeah oh you know the other thing is like you know the idea that a cop's gonna go to somebody's window and you know he's gonna have his gun already drawn i i think that's probably different now people are approaching people already suspecting that they could be in danger so it would be a little harder but i mean that stuff like that's still possible i guess yeah now i thought it'd be fun to wrap this up with the real casanova and if the name you know fit or not and i think the name does kind of does fit so casanova was and this is quick was in a, an Italian, an, in, an impotent prisoner. <laughs> oh, no. Well, hey, no, listen. He was he was quote the world's greatest lover. So I don't. This guy was not impotent. I got to give him that right off the bat. So, but he wasn't a great guy. He was an Italian adventurer in the mid 1700s. Um, but the, the, the real Casanova sucks too, though. And I'm not a person who judges historical figures based. I, like against the modern morality. I, I, I don't think that's why he sucked, but let's listen to a couple of the things that he's, he's famous for, well-known for. So he was an incestuous rapist and pedophile. One story has him staying at a friend's house. The, his, a couple of friends let him stay over and he impregnated their 15 year old daughter and denied the child even though the, the, the daughter had never ever had sex with anyone else. Worst house guest ever. Right, a thousand percent. And during a carnival, he raped a woman, quote, in his own um, memoirs here, he raped, raped a woman as a joke and said, quote, she loved it. So this wow. is this is kind of a bad dude. And he bought sex slaves, some as young as nine. This one's really tough too. He slept with his teenage daughter and thinks everyone should. And in his memoirs, he stated, do you really love them if you don't? That was his, that was his quote. <laughs> it's just like intense. Um, and that's, so the real Casanova, also a piece of shit. So he can have the name. 
Greg, and, if you go to bed tonight, I want you to really reflect on that uh, hmm. on that last quote that you said. You know, and just ask yourself, <laughs> you love your kids. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. When I think of Casanova, I'm going to think of the guy from American Pie, the one true Casanova, the one deserving of a of a. When you think of Casanova, and you can think of it with a smile on your face, Chris Klein. Any final thoughts for you? I mean, we've taken this thing. I, I mean, I my the only thing I keep coming back to is. You know, picking locks was cool. I I was really into that when I was kid. I used to try that all the time. Yeah, I think this what I love about the story, and it's a horrible story, but the element of it that I found found to be like entertaining is the contradiction of who he is. Mm -hmm. He is this person who, by some means, is like lucky, has all these opportunities. He's uh somewhat gifted in the looks department and has the ability to, like he must have some kind of charisma in order to be able to attract people with his personality but then is actually underneath it all nothing of that yeah it makes you kind of think if you're um if you're a young lady out there and you you see a handsome guy at the bar who who's there's just something about him you know think twice you never know you, you don't you don't know what's in someone's brain you don't know what they're up, yeah. what they're up to. It should be careful. <laughs> yeah. And like, you know, don't judge a guy just because he has like an old fashioned mustache, you know, like he's probably the nicer guy. No, but you know what? You see, <laughs> if you see me walking to a bar, you are going to be a little like, what the hell? Maybe a little nervous. Like, what's up with that? And I think that's OK. You should be that way. And then I'm the safe one. But then you leave with the guy with the beautiful hair. And next thing you know, I mean, she's reading obituaries over here. I mean, I mean, happy Valentine's Day is what I mean to say. Happy Valentine's Day. Be safe. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for taking this ride with us for preparation of Valentine episode. Oh, yeah. There's I, more to come. There is a couple more episodes to come. I, I can't remember actually how many more episodes we're going to do valentine's related but it's also going to be black history month next month so we're going to be bearing it up so we can kind of cover a lot of ground here um excited about some of these topics and we hope you will be too so thank you everyone for listening please consider leaving a rating and review if you are so inclined we appreciate it we love the feedback actually even just people leaving us feedback on social media has been awesome yeah uh, we got some really amazing stuff recently for feedback and I am so, so incredibly humbled and honored to, you know, hear that people are connecting with it, but also that like people actually found it impactful mm. and that's like, wow. It makes it worth it digging into all this and, and doing our best to get something out every week and the, all the work that goes into it. it. It really does make it worth it. And if we can, you know, get one message that we've done something for someone i mean that makes it it's that's everything to us yeah i we recently got a pretty amazing message about the scream three episode and the final girl thing and just you know as that kind of being like my my brainchild i am like so flattered and that made my my month probably um maybe my year but just hearing one person connect to something that's like meaningful to us is is absolutely amazing so thank you everyone for the feedback and just for listening and being cool mm. she, she didn't say it but i think she she was really feeling the part with when i talked about the essence and the philosophical side of it yeah, too. totally yeah. she didn't she didn't mention it but i could kind of tell just by the way <laughs> absolutely <laughs> well thank you everyone and hey my mom loves the alchemist episode and that's your oh one. that's my baby, baby yeah so. yeah we uh, we have a baby and we haven't done yet, but we won't even say who who that is. I, I think Frankel's our baby. Frankel's not a baby, but yeah. we, for, I mean, we're not Frankel's daddies. Weird the way that was phrased, <laughs> but it's coming your way, people. Yeah, yeah. Well, someday, someday, maybe never. Now that we put it like that, now we're in Paris. Uh, All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. See you later. See you later. <laughs>